Okay. Hello, welcome to another of our 60th anniversary Doctor Who YouTube specials uh, with me, Michael S. Collins, and my colleague, Mr. John Arnold. Hello. Uh, remember, if you like this, you can always comment or press the like button or subscribe, uh, which I need to mention now, otherwise my daughter will tell me off because I keep forgetting to mention it in the videos. <laughs> So today we're looking at Doctor Who's TV directors, uh, as voted for by you, the fan. And we have a top 15, which sadly saw no room for Christopher Barry, Fiona Cummings, Ow. or Michael Ferguson, who would definitely be in the top of mine. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think yeah. if we had more more um, episodes of it, I think some some like Tristan Devere Cole and Hugh David might well be it up for up for some. I think this one suffered from the fact that it's a uh, techie nerds like me who are really interested in the framing and how these things are shot, whereas most normal Doctor Who fans just go, "That looks nice," but they couldn't tell you who did X, Y, and Z, <laughs> uh, unless they're a standout name like some of the people who are up at the top of this list. And another person who didn't make it, and I know this is going to really upset John, because he loves waxing logically about them, is uh, Peter Moffat. No. <laughs> Harsh. He's no Richard Martin. Oh, and Richard <laughs> Martin's also not on the list. Oh, you surprise me. <laughs> I admire his ambition, if nothing yes. else. I'll see. Richard Martin went out on a high with that mechanoid battle, which I always thought was Douglas Campbell, but no, it was it was Martin. So, 15th place, it's a freeway tie. We've got James Hawes, who directed The Empty Child, Christmas Invasion, uh, New Earth and School Reunion in the new series. Uh, Alan Waring, who directed one of John's favourite stories ever. And Pedant Roberts. Who directed a number of stories <laughs> uh, and he was very specifically backed by our friend uh, Steve Atkins, Mr McRanny, who said we had to point out that even if people don't like the end results of a lot of parents' stories um, for example he was the director on Warriors for the Deep and we know all the stories behind that um, we should note that his determination to get impossible stories on screen is worthy of comment. He's the only person that thought the Pirate Planet could be filmed by the BBC. And more specifically, we should note that in a very enclosed BBC, he was a rare voice determined to give actresses a chance on the show, even when there, there was no female roles in the, in the scripts. He would make the roles female to give people chances when Absolutely. other people were refusing to. Uh, and for that, you know, he, I think, yes, I agree, he deserves his moment in the sun. So, I mean, it, it would be unfair to judge him on Warriors of Deep because I believe they lost, was it two weeks of time to, um, of the, was it the election? If I, I think Margaret Thatcher calling an earlier election than yes. Anyone would have struggled on that. You can put Rachel Talley, Douglas Canfield, whoever, and they would not. They would be unlikely to produce their best work. Yes, I, I absolutely give him credit for getting things on screen, but no, I'm not a particular fan of his direction because I, I don't think it's particularly dynamic. I, you know, I, I don't think the blocking on stuff is particular is genuinely good. Obviously, I'd cite the murker if I wasn't being a hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um, James Hawes, lovely to see him on there as well, yeah, because The Empty Child is terrifically well directed. I think there's elements of, of almost Japanese horror stuff in there, um, the yes. way it's shot, and maybe, maybe he's drawing on uh, the Ringu, etc., which were quite sort of in vogue at times. I'm wearing, obviously, I'm going to say that I love seeing him in this list. The story I, I would say is my favorite all time, I will say that is great to show in the galaxy, and he again. He got that production on. He shot that outdoors, and it looks so. It's got such a beautiful look to it compared to the others. It doesn't show that. Yeah, you know, it, it's not indoors. So mm. he had. It's a different feel to it. 
Bob always talks about with the special effects being overly enthusiastic with the explosion of the Doctor just walking out. One of the defining images of the Seventh Doctor's era. Number 14, Paul Joyce. Uh, a one-hit wonder from the show, but Warriors Gate, he works really well with fade-ins and so, Bidry, the, 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 the overflowing uh, wine, go uh, wine goblet. Yes. Of Sunwell, they're talking about slavery ethics. Um, and... I, I can't remember the name of the painting now, but you've got that. The, there's a, it's a wintry painting. I mean, that, it's it's a, it's covered quite brilliantly in, in the Black Archive on it. Um, Warriors Gate, because I know Frank Collins, who wrote it, went and interviewed Paul Joyce and got him, got statements on him from it. And it's the way he uses the studio as well. You know, he uses the gallery of the studio. Um, yes. Fact, the one caveat I'll get, we don't know how much Graham Harper did at that either. Because uh, it was a troubled production. Yes. And Dunn's, he's probably the most the visual eye for it. Yeah, he, he's of... the one you can pick out. It, they, uh, there's something in John Nathan Turner's first season, they really do go for the directors who, or they try to look for directors who have this visual sense. You know, love at Bickford um, in the first one, and then Paul Joyce later on. Oh, number 13 is a Doctor Who legend who maybe some people forget also directed the show. Uh, I'm talking about Barry Letts. Oh, I'm not as big a fan of his direction. I, I like his. I love the way he pushes technologically to use green screen or you know, he gets the helicopter shots in Enemy of the World. Mm. I always kind of find his direction a bit undynamic and I, it, it shows up in something like Planet of the Spiders. The chick seems nice, but the Meta Beers 3 sequences are yes. not very good. I think where he stands up best is in rapid action shot, rapid action yes. scenes. Like uh, the first episode of Enemy of the World. With the hovercraft, that's that works at quite a pace. Or the early scenes in Android Invasion, with their there's that. that. Mm. Yes, I know people. Some people are like the chase in Planet of the Spiders, yes. the multi vehicle thing. That yes. needs, I, mean, I, I don't think there are many directors in Doctor Who that could have pulled that off at all. Yes, I, I respect his uh, willingness to push. Uh, groundbreaking technology that perhaps other people went off with the, the green screen at the time. Totally. Or, or blue screen, as it was. Blue screen, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from, 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 from little steps, we have modern TV. Yes, totally. It, it's, a, it's a great thing to see. I also like the fact he's on the list because, you know, if he was here, he'd disagree and say that he didn't actually do anything himself and Oh, this bit totally. wrong and that bit wrong and this one's go no baddie you were amazing <laughs> so I, I, um, I can't remember which DVD is on it but there's, it's the footage of him doing the in the technical guide for the BBC on yes. how to do uh, the CSO as it was then Carnival of Monsters this, the original commentary has one of the great bits where basically it's him and Katie and Barry spends the entire thing criticising his own direction. I've like, oh, got that wrong. Should have done that. Shouldn't have. And then there's a bit where the, the trash eggs appear and he's suddenly silent. And Katie Manning asks if he's okay. And he goes, that really worked. And he's just like, this moment where he's actually realised something he did works yeah. really well. That's why he ends up being so good at what he does generally. He has that self-critical eye. Yes. Although... I would say that it was overly critical, but then that's probably why he was so great because he was so inclusive of a thing the the praise to other people. Okay. Number twelve. Oh, it's the director of one of my favourite stories. It's Morris Barry. Good directed the Moonbase and <laughs> the Cybermen. And what I will say for Morris Barry is that he is very good at framing shots. So that you can see every character reacting in so like the, the scenes in the Gravitron room where the Doctor's trying to convince various people that the Iron Man are there or the, the, the his his iconic scene of the Cybermen waking up in the tombs, they are very well shot because he has the cameras exactly where you need to get the most out of them. 
And, and again, those set pieces are really nice. Then the um, the side men on the moon, um, yes, well, chasing Benoit in the moon base, or again, as you say, the, the where they come out of hibernation, they're very well remembered. And there's a really good reason for that. Action shots are quite important, and some directors do forget them, and mm-hmm. that gives them more impact. Benoit on the moon, but the episode three of the moon base is a partly the bit. Everyone remembers from that ep- the, the, the the calling card of the moon base, and it's in the bloody missing episode. <laughs> that's the part. That's the bit where I could, I, if I if it existed, I could just show up and go, well, "Yep, yeah, right, fine, you're right, Michael. It is the greatest." But no, they had to lose the bloody episode. Number eleven, uh, Euros Lynn. He was one of the go tos for the Russell T Davis era. Um... Certainly, I, I believe was 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 quite involved in Rose uncredited. <clears throat> yes. Mm-hmm. Um, it is. I don't know if he was involved in the shenanigans around the the action era. Obviously, he didn't come back for the later episodes. But he, you know, he was again a, a good modern director. He he turns out some very good stories. Um, is it the end of the world? Is his first one? I think, yes. He does end of the world and, and quite dead. Yeah, and again, he cap- captures the Doctor and Rose. Yes, that thing. He and that that opening uh, sequence of Unquiet Dead. I I know it's the one trait, what the one teaser sequence for the first series that the Doctor and Rose aren't in. So they got a wave at the piece, and he comes up with a ends that on a beautifully memorable image. I'm not entirely sure Kung Fu Priest is one of RTT's greatest ideas to bring to the show. But he well, just it, about it, manages it, to make them work and yes. and call. Um, number ten, stalwart of the classic era, uh, David Maloney. Uh, I, I would say he's underrated this look. Such a stylist. Uh, I love his use of mirror reflection to show stuff. Like in the war games, you see the tar the TARDIS land through a puddle, yes. reflecting. Um. And he would always, uh, particularly with, I think with Tom and John, he would cast a taller actor yes. against them so they have a visual foil. By know, taller actor, you mean obviously, Bernard, like, Bernard Horsfall always. <laughs> Although it wasn't until I was watching Enemy of the Gate, I really quite how tall Bernard Horsfall is. He's also very fond of freeze frames. Absolutely. And to, I mean, that that's the only reason the, the cliffhanger on Genesis 2 works, isn't it? Yes. This is the reason why Genesis of the Daleks works for me, because I think Genesis, as it stands, the best versions of it are the LP version and the condensed repeat, because as it, it's it's essentially just a, a normal Terry Nation script, um, which could probably be produced in almost any era, but it wouldn't be half as effective if it wasn't allowed like, to be as hard-edged as it is in... Yeah. It's and, and Dave Maloney's big the way he shoots that that opening suit, the slow motion gun fights at the start. Um the way the way he frames that the have I the right scene. Yes. Tom, Tom in the middle with the two wires. That's a beautiful bit of visual storytelling. And technically he's the perfect director for the, the, the Holmes Hinchcliffe era because they're all about how far can they get the line without crossing it, and he's like, "Where is the line?" <laughs> no, it's a what line? So it's the, line. the one that's ro- way back over there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Number nine is a director we only got briefly, which I think is still a shame because the stuff he produced was so good. Not really done much since, I don't think. Uh, Joe Hearn, uh, who did Dalek and Bad Wolf. Uh, he did most of the back half of Chris Reckles' the season. I think he did. Yes, uh, I remember where he was a very close friend of Chris Reckles at the time. Yes, um, and known before that because he did um, he did Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is mm-hmm. a magnificent series. Really, and you you can see the the visual links. Are, yes, those episodes had such verve and energy to them. It, it the pace of the storytelling is wonderful. And then Boomtown, which needs a slightly different... And he, he manages to film and sell the, those kind of chase scenes with Annette Badland and, you know, the Eccleston TARDIS crew, which is a very difficult technically one to... Technical one. The bits that stick with me is the one in Dalek is his the framing of 
the gallant versus a hundred people, and it wins with two three shots. Is this a zoom out as well when the Dalek gets free? Yes. The bit in Bad Wolf where the controller is take is is that back to the Dalek chip, and you see the Daleks mirrored on the steel behind. You don't you don't see the you just see the reflection as the exterminator. That's a wonderfully done shot too. Oh, and of course the the Linda with the wife, the de- her death. Yes, gorgeously shot. Number eight, Derek Martinus. Again, I, I think he'd be rated higher if we have more of his episodes. Yes. He loves he loves his soundscape. I bring you the tundra of the the pole in the tenth planet, which is one of the most effective alien landscapes in its earth. Yes. But it's just so well done. He loves People doing stuff in the background, but focused, so you're actually, it's not, you're not seeing it immediately, but it's pivotal. Like, the uh, Cutler coming into the scene in the 10th planet, and there's uh, the reveal of Channing and Spearhead from Space. Every aspect of the screen, something could be happening. The thing that always strikes me with Derek Martin in this, this work is his love of the looming camera pan. You'll see it, and then the camera will slowly pan across. And if there's characters showing their character reveal by saying nothing, all the better. And the one that really gets me, uh, you know, is there's a bit in the 10th planet where he's in the control room, and he's got the camera moving this way, so you can see all the characters, and he's going to go down to focus on Robert Beatty. But to do that, the camera goes up and over part and set there and down and round. And to this day, I have genuinely no idea how he achieved that on a BBC camera in 1966. Because it should have been impossible as a camera shot. It, and that's that's why I think he's generally one of the greats. Because he was doing things that you shouldn't have been able to do somehow to get to make the show more dynamic and interesting. Yeah, and what I always go with Derek Martinez is with the when Galaxy 4 came back, you know, Galaxy 4 is, has never been that highly regarded a story because it's it is quite slight. But the, but I think you're watching it and we you know, we don't know the visuals of it. That that's it. We can't say what a director did or didn't do. Um but the thing that always struck me is how his decision to basically get Stephanie Bidme to deliver a monologue straight to camera and hold on that. And it is such a compelling decision rather than her just, you know, mm-hmm. talking to, with his computers around. It's an unusual one for Doctor Who and it works so beautifully. And also, it, it, the other bit in that that shows me somebody thinking about the show that you might not think about is um, he's got mud inside the broken... Uh, spaceship. Who think to put mud inside the spaceship because it's obviously broken. The elements are in. Absolutely. Number seven, another regular from the seventies, Michael Bryant, Michael E. Bryant, uh, who directed the Sea Devils, Green Death, Death to the Alex, Revenge of the Cybermen, and the Robots of Death. And there's some. I would agree with. Or uh, fan book here, there's a lot of very well put together episodes among that. Uh, yeah, the Sea Devils again. I have been re watched, and, and there's a lovely, a lovely speech they do on the DVDs now behind the soap where they get people to watch it and mm-hmm. some companion stuff on the era. And the one for this was Katie and Mike Libra, and he was very, very um, happy to, to take a look at stuff. And it was and he was happy with the way it turned out because again, you've got all the all the hardware. That is not an easy direct thing to direct yes. with with the way, you know, the conditions. Mm. And again, the casting. Well, trench, trenched. I think the way it becomes. I think he. I think there is a the bit of business. It's a bit of business, and I I suspect it's improvised. And he's let it in, where trenched is basically. You know, the doctor is on the other side of the door, knocks on the door. Trenched just goes, "Go away, I'm busy," and he's playing golf. Yes. 
Yeah, and then the doctor just barges in and Trencher just that just like puts a and carries on like nothing's happened. And it just speaks it's such a good piece of character telling with you know, visual character telling. It's gorgeous. And I think he's so good at that. I like the way the robot, you see the robot point of view, robots are deaf. Mm. That's very well done. Which from the Black Lagoon type um, yes. thing. The, I think the cave work in Rangers just have very well done. Yes, I, I think he's really good with the, that outside broadcast stuff with conditions that the directors might not take on. Yes, for all you're maybe not a fan of Deaf to the Daleks, he really directs the hell out of the stuff that works. Yes, I, I I will be fair and, and say entirely that. My issue with that is more the Terry Nationism of it. So. Episode one works really well, and that's right down to the, the horror levels. Yes, it... absolutely. It, I I love the books in places, but yes, it's it's the atmosphere of it. And Green Death is just E level. Mm, there's no there's no fluff there. It's straight everything, and there's a lot of iconic scenes. Well done in it. The temptation is to judge directors on the on the memorable images, isn't it? Yes. And I think he scores very, very well on that. Mm. Plus, I should point out that all of these ones, the casting is very good. Russell Hunter, Pamela Salim, uh, Kevin Stoney, uh, P. John Abaneri, John Derf. It's a roll call of character actors, isn't Clive it? Clive Morton, that's just a, a few actors. of them. Number six is he was a young director who showed so much promise in the show, but then, sadly, we, we lost him to cancer, so we never really got to see what he might have gone to achieve. Um, number six is Peter Grimwade. I, that, the, he, he is insane on the way he directs the shot the way the number of shots in that camera script yes is ridiculous and the one thing i will give him credit for particularly on earth shock is the casting because eric saywood as we all know hated the casting of beryl reed yes. peter grimwade has been the production assistant on tinker taylor he knows how good an actress yes. beryl reed is and it's a much more interesting cast than saywood standard Hard bitten space captain, and then he's directed Kinder in the same season, which is an almost entirely different thing. <laughs> it's a studio about it's a philosophical piece. You, people will, might talk about the, you know, the snake, but you try pulling that off on the BBC budget at the time. He manages to do the the sort of uh, ethereal Kinder stuff really well. He does an action. He does. He does a, an action movie on the cheap, very well for Earthshot. He does the funeral atmosphere of Agopolis and mm. Bill Circle. Circle. Yes, I get that. That was one that terrified me as a kid. That the, the spy. I look at it now. And go. Oh yeah. But I was asking. The spiders in that were. Yes. Leaky. Big spider. Jeez. I mean. Yeah. Sorry, the, the things that come most to me with uh, Grimwade's work is uh, obviously, as you said, lots of quick scenes. I think there's one episode of the Earthshot where there has to be at least 100 camera cuts to keep yeah. the story going. It, it's because a lot of the, the people, I think Jen T. High from this point on, were old hands. And they maybe weren't quite up with the way TV was developing. Grimwade and I think later Graham Harper are very dynamic directors. And it really it really shows when you watch those against the other stuff. You know, some say you go from Fall to Doomsday, uh, John Black to Kinder. Kinder's so much more dynamic, or you know, Time Flight is the one side and Black Orchid the other. Again, Earthshock, it just all looks modern, dynamic. It's a way forward. He's also very good with close-ups. He loves his close-ups of characters thinking and talking. Yes. Um, I'm aware of the Peter Davison story of him having to rehearse and suddenly right in his face was uh, Peter Grimley going like that. 
to get yeah. the, the, the internal image of what the close-up would look like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look at the other shot, cliffhangers. They, they all depend on close-ups. The, the first one's a close-up of the side men. The second one, you close up on ringway. The third one, the side men coming, and it's close-up on the Doctor's face. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, he but knew that power of the close-up. I get the impression he drove Davison nuts at the time. But now he can look back on it, he sees yeah. how, what, what the, it, how good the end results were. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think he, I think if we were talking about directors to work for, he sounds an absolute killer to work for almost. Yes. He, he would push the actors hard. But yeah, but the results are, I, I, I think they elevate this every story. Yes. I think he, I think he's four for four on well directed stories. And um, that's from someone who doesn't like the gop of this. Yes. It's just a shame that he got sick because he was only 47 when he died and he'd had cancer for nearly a decade before that. So, so uh, if, if you haven't seen it on YouTube as well, I, I thoroughly recommend the drama, the drama armor he did or yes. I think he wrote and directed The Comeuppance of Captain Cats, which apparently is a commentary on Doctor Who production. You know, yes. Time. Although I, I, I'm told the JNT took it personally, I've not seen it. But somebody I know who has seen it, they, they don't understand how JNT could have taken it personally because anyone could see it's Tom Baker. <laughs> yes. no, this is where you're stronger than me. This is where I like listening to you on directors. <laughs> much stronger uh, thing than I am. Number five. Well, it's that time in the podcast. Who do we always talk about our love for? It's the one and only Paddy Russell. <laughs> Four very different yes. stories, I think. I think we might rename this thing the Paddy Russell fan club. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Learn from Rudolph Cartier, so you know what, what mm. else? Boss Rudolph Cartier around. <laughs> so, not many people did that. <laughs> uh, I love the fact that she took, she wanted to be an actress, but realised that. Actresses were getting stiff for pay. VVC. I don't know if you can imagine that. Uh, so she took the director's course, and despite having passed it as one of the highest ranked folk that year, she couldn't get a job at the BBC as the director. So her response to that was to storm into Sydney Newman's office and yell at him for being sexist. And if we've learned anything about Sidney Newman over the years, it's clearly that was the best career move you can make for Sidney Newman because he gave her a job on the spot. Absolutely. Scary is one of the great losses because I would love to see what Paddy Russell did with it because he was so good directing these actors in dramatic situations. Oh. On the woodcuts and that the scene where the doctor has his monologue because she, took, she went on in great detail about how he worked with Hartnell, who was quite ill by that point, about how what an important line that it was for the doctor and how he, he delivered it no perfect yes. first time. If I could be anywhere as a fly in the wall as a Doctor Who fan over the years, I would have wanted to be in the room when Paddy Russell saw the dinosaur models she had to work with. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's a bit in episode two where the T-Rex walks backwards quickly off the set as if it's just been dragged off. And I like to think that was Paddy Russell. Um, but <laughs> having said that, who else would take those and actually make them almost work? Again, I've written a book on this one too. So I've seen this a lot, particularly recently. It it it's so atmospheric and well directed. That first episode, the deserted London. Yes, it's so beautiful. You know, the guerrilla filming they did. You know, mm -hmm. the permits out they go early on a Sunday mornings, and they get those wonderful shots, which which just set which just perfectly set that scene. And I didn't realize until I got the DVD with the color first episode because I'd only ever seen them black and white. What? The guy's bleeding everywhere when he's been trampled. Yeah. Subversive Paddy. I can't like that. <laughs> Another director where you have Louis Jameson saying that they did not get on at the time and that yeah. but you look back at she then looks back at what they achieved after the fact. One thing I do respect for her is the way she would actually completely 
Hope put her foot down and defend actors. Um, the prime example being uh, Colin Douglas in Horror of Fang Rock, because she instantly thought he was the person to play the dual role of Ruben the Lighthouse Keeper and the Rutan. And someone higher up, possibly Graham Williams, was uh, sceptical of this to the point where she said, no, he has to have the role, so they got him in to do a sort of uh, a take, a, an addition take of it. Mm. So he did it, and they thought, he's working really well here. So then Paddy Russell asked if, or she asked him to do the smile that they have in the script, the written smile. So he did the one you see on screen and scared the living out of everyone in that room. <laughs> and decades later, Paddy Russell interviewed said that um, she knew he'd be good in the role. She didn't realise he'd be that good. Absolutely. And again, uh, Pyramids of Mars, she's working with a static villain who's miles yes. away generally. And she makes him, again, she makes him terrifying. Yes. In the voice. And that, that, the episode one cliffhanger is so down to her too. That I bring to good text of death. All terrified. He does that me as a child. Again, yeah, the te the technical difficulty of that shot with the smoking foot. Yeah, and speaking of te technical difficulties again in dinosaurs, who else would have tried that? Bessie going under the diplodocus. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And it's just she's very good at that. She's also really good at actors and framing yes. in that. So I again, think the casting to the, is always almost perfect. You know, from you know, you would say Gabriel Eric Thompson in the massacre. Um, oh God, I mean, who's it? Um, Martin Jarvis in a minor role, for God's sake, in yes. uh, the invasion of dinosaurs. And as I said, Colin Douglas, brilliant stories. And, and let's not forget as well, Horror Fang Rock, the show moves to Birmingham for for, for a, the production. She's working with an unfamiliar crew in an unfamiliar yeah. setting. How many directors would actually pull something as atmospheric, as well shot as that off in that circumstance? Uh, number four, the man who was there at the beginning and he's had such a great career since, Horace is saying. Uh, I, 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 I watch An Unearthly Child on 23rd of November every single year. You know, as a part, I, I, I try to get, I'm trying to do the same on the 26th of March for Rose as well, but that's a different way. And what I'm always struck by for the time is how fluid, how his cam work is, how many cuts he gets in. Fourth episode of An Earthy Child, where, where they're watching the battle between Cal and Zar. Yeah. It, it's, it's all shot like sport. Yes. It's so beautifully done. It's, you know, and again, that, that willingness to experiment in the first episode with, with the shots, with integrating the title sequence in there, There's the way he picks up the zoom out from London, Again, beautiful visual storytelling. I wish we could see the singing sounds. I wish we could see all the Marco Polo. It's, <laughs> um, it's uh, 500, yeah. 500 Eyes is the one I want to see. Oh, uh, he, he went on the, 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 the storytelling. I want to see how he shoots that. I really love to see it because he is so good. I mean, he made his career on that and he went on to the Jewel on the Crown. You can't really... No, I, I, I'm the only getting thing is, you know, I, I wish he'd been able to accept that five doctors invitation. Mm -hmm. Number three is the highest ranked director to do a new who exclusively. And that is Rachel Talali. Okay, I, I think she should be, I think she'd be top because I, I know the technical differences. She has such a cinematic feel to her work. Yeah. There's a reason why she's essentially, you know, showrunner's privilege. She gets Stephen Moffat's script, and the, she's coming back for this. For the, I think it's the first episode of the Russell T Davis era. No, she's definitely coming back this year. Yeah, I particularly, I, I think with her, the one I obviously, you go to heaven sent. The way she shoots that castle, the that is such a difficult set to to shoot around, but also. That opening of Hellbent with the with the the Western sensibility to yes. it, yes. And yeah, you know, I, I don't think the doctor the doctor doesn't say a word for the first what ten minutes or something like that or fifteen minutes. Plus, 
how difficult is Heaven Sent to get on screen? I think it's quite a challenge. Yeah, the moving well, parts of that castle, the just the and the, the confined spaces. What's the fact it's a monologue? And it looks just fine being there because of the way Rachel Tyler has shot it and the way yeah. and the way she's giving Peter Capaldi the space to do what he does so well. You know, I mean, Peter Capaldi, he's a gift to any director, let's face yeah. it. I mean, it's amusing that we have a Doctor Who director who cut their teeth on Friday the 13th. And the Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, number two is a uh, 60s legend who came back briefly for the 70s. And uh, I'm hoping to get his biography soon in the post. Uh, Douglas Canfield. I have read this biography. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone who I think his it was his military background that people keep saying he ran his shows like military yes. operation. So that to the point where you know Barry Letts could go in on Inferno mm -hmm. and he had no script and he could he could just work straight from that. Um so well over he would it strikes me as the guy who would again he would always get the every last drop out of the cast and crew. He just just the way he ran and I get the particularly with the technology he's working with in the sixties and seventies, it's so dynamic. It's so fast, but you know, you watch something like the invasion, it should be a lot duller than it is, because there's a lot of build up hmm. for, to get to, you know, the exciting cyber invasion bit. But it's it's such a such a fun and interesting watch. He makes everyone sitting standing around watching a computer screen for ten minutes, thrilling in episode eight. Yes, even if, that they, sound. even if they lampshade it with Benson, going, "This is going to be a long time." <laughs> <laughs> propensity for implying things through the shots. Uh, the best example of this is Inferno, where the technician is beaten down by the guy who's getting who's zonked by the green stuff and it gets up a big wrench and he slams down and immediately cuts to the the nail getting hammered into the wall so they can put the regular photo up. Slow come up, yeah. You, 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 you've, just, you've just experienced a horrifically violent death without seeing anything. But see, it's yeah. true. One of the best shots, yeah, one of the best shots of that era, totally. Yes, but the same, he does it again in Zygons, where there's a few really bad, but it, it's quick cut to something else happening. Uh, I think it's, a, it's the same trick with uh, Angus Lenny dealing with the... Oh, the moose's head. The moose's head. So you don't actually see the, the violence. But the other thing that he loves is the... You see it in the crusade to create uh, thing for the the action scenes is the sort of the live view from above of what's going on. So his cameras are up high, looking down on everyone. Yes, uh, it, it's he, he is again. He, I know, I know he, he he's kind of that first director of the TV, right? Because I think he really cuts his teeth on TV rather than on the stage. But he knows he's shooting a stage play there almost. Yes, and it's shot like a stage, and it works so well. Okay, you, you look at the diversity of stories that he, do, he does, starts with the crusade and then there's the time meddler as well. Again, beautifully shot. You know, some of the scenes up on the cliff for his, where, he, where he's spraying yes. the TARDIS crew. The and again, <laughs> you've got the eagle eye downwards on the TARDIS crew from above, but it's the perspective of the med, the monk. And the monk, the monk at the start with the perspective looking down on them. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And then he goes straight on and does the Dalek Master Plan, which is, frankly, insane with the amount of stuff you need to fit in there. You, know, you need to yes. fit in Hollywood. You need to fit in you know, a planet with invisible aliens on it. You need to fit in Egypt. It's, oh my, you need to fit in Lord's Cricket Ground. It's like, gee, what the hell? A shame some of his bare bits and that are possibly lost. Number one, then. I can only be one. It is Graham Harper. The only man to and so good he can make you. Story work. Um, and he's kind of the opposite about to David Canfield, David Canfield here, because uh, Canfield likes his bird eye shots looking down, 
and Graham Harper loves the cameras going low and looking up and making everything taller than it would otherwise be. He does that to great effect with the Daleks and Cybermen. Uh, yes, absolutely. The yes, the impression of power that he gives yes. to them from below. Yeah, I mean, Ken Greve does something similar in Destiny, of course. Um, yeah, and and he loves that close up as well. That, that you know, with Andrew's art, he should wait the way huge John Normington when he's doing he's doing yeah. his Mars camera, almost you know, the tight close beautifully. You're talking the, the cliffhanger of the Davison part three. With the way, again, it's, it's the way it closes in on him, on his face, on that as well. Desperate, and as you said, the regeneration effect, and that's kind of building it up. And again, technically, the way they build that regeneration in um, in part four, because he said it's, I find it fascinating. He wasn't taking a visual inspiration from it, but the, he was good. He wanted to have the feel of uh, the the. End of a day in the life by the Beatles. Yes. You know, the, it all ends, you know, it all builds up to that final mm. chord, then boom. Uh, you've got the uh, Celatine, who's generally one of the biggest characters in Androzani, gets yeah. blasted to death down the, the down a, a, a corridor by an android, and the camera treats it as if it's just a, your average red dirt. and it it gives a sort of realism to that scene because. Essentially, he is. They're just a bunch of doomed people at the wrong place at the wrong time. The one that I've always remembered is in Revelation, where there's a shot where he, instead of like instead of cutting from one seat to the other, there's a, it's almost a track downwards of a, mm -hmm. a vertical track rather than a horizontal. Yes, it's just re effects because you just what the hell? But no, you think that is just really, really clever way of, of cutting between the scenes and without. Being dull, but being twenty first century, but quite have the same. They, they quite have the same brio as maybe, um, but, but that's because you can't have that at fifties um, yes. and sixties. You know, he, the tricks he knows are old as much as anything, yes. but he developed them slightly, so he's not going to look quite as flashy and as. But, but they, they still work at brilliant these productions. The thing that really stands out for me for him is that. Uh, he is the avant-garde enfant terrible of the 80s in terms of being ahead of everyone else apart from like maybe if you want to come in and uh, and we've been on the same idea level but then we've seen what happened in the show when you bring directors who were great in their time long after they should have I mean Peter Moffat is a example of time because in the sixties, he was the guy to go for the type of show that Doctor Who wanted to be by the eighties, but by the eighties, even in the sixties. Um, yeah. So when they, but then when they brought Graham Harper back as an older man, twenty five years later to do Doctor Who, he wasn't the standout guy anymore, but he still fit into modern TV so reasonably well that that shows how hard the kind of assignment was for me. Absolutely. So he, he, he gave those sidemen impact and you needed to give those sidemen impact on their first stories, but you need to do they are these big, invincible metal machines. Yeah. yeah I, I don't think, I can't think of anyone else who'd be able to transverse the errors so effortlessly. Absolutely. Um, but yes, that was Doctor Who Directors. Uh, I hope this was interesting and maybe illuminating to some folk who were confused when I asked the question. Um, don't worry, I'm sure we'll find more reasons to wax lyrically about Eddie Russell and her fan club here <laughs> next time. 